been in John chapter 17 for a long time, almost basically all summer, as we've looked at the prayer of Jesus, and we've come to the last thing that he prayed about uh, that we're looking at, and that is proclamation. Uh, we saw that uh, there was uh, the necessity of salvation, uh, praying that people would have eternal life, and that eternal life would be found in union with him, which is unification. He prayed about the glorification of God. He prayed about the revelation of truth, that it would be revealed to people. He prayed about sanctification, that people would be holy, that they would know holiness in their lives. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, he prayed for preservation, and last week that's what we talked about, the preservation of God, which is wonderful. Jesus prayed that we would be kept. And if you're a true believer, if you actually become a true believer, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What a promise. If you haven't seen last week's message, I encourage you to look it up online and listen to it. Uh, it can be a, such a blessing to you to know that it's God that keeps you, not you that keeps God. You're not very good. You can't keep yourself, let alone keep God, right? <laughs> But God, imagine God's making promises and saying, I'm going to keep you no matter what you go through. Oh, what a confidence to be able to have as a believer in Jesus Christ. But we weren't meant to keep such good news to ourselves. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be fair to do that kind of thing. There's a story in the Old Testament about lepers that were starving to death because they were under siege by the enemy. And Israel was under siege. Jerusalem was under siege. They were gated in there. They were dying. And people were actually talking about, you know, cooking their children and eating them. That's how bad it had gotten. And in the midst of all of that horrible situation, the lepers, of course, they got nothing at all. They said, we're going to die where we are, so we might as well go to the enemy's camp. And if they kill us, they kill us. At least we know they got food. So the lepers went, and they get to the camp. But God had done something. It had been prophesied that he would, and he did. The enemy had scattered. They were gone. God caused them to go. And there was food galore. And so they were feasting away. And suddenly, while they were just eating away, they said, this isn't right. For us to be here and to have all of this, and we know that our fellow neighbors, even though they you know, rejected us, they're starving there. So they decided to go back to the camp and tell them. And they ran into some trouble at the gate because they wouldn't believe them at first and told them to get lost. But basically, eventually they did come out and they found food for the, for the whole city. But they couldn't keep it to themselves. Are we keeping the gospel to ourselves? Are we afraid what people might think? Or are we selfish? It's not hard to be selfish. We live in a very selfish society. The story is told of a man who applied for a job as an usher in a theater. And the uh, man that was interviewing him, he said, well, tell me what you th would happen if there was a fire. And the man who was wanting the job said, oh, you don't have to worry about me. I'll get out in plenty of time. Oh. <laughs> so what's the problem there? He didn't care about the fellows in the theater, right? He wanted to know, what would you do in case of a fire? What would you do to help people? No, you don't got to worry about me. I got, an, I got my escape route. And sometimes Christians, we can be like that. We, I don't have to worry about this. I know where I'm going. But do you care about the people that are around you? Do you care for their souls? Do you realize that people who die without Christ are lost? And sometimes we can miss that. Well, when Jesus was praying in John chapter 17, we see that he did care about the people that were in the world. He said, I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, that is the believers. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you've given me. They may be one as we are. They may be in unity with me and in unity with one another. That's the kind of unity there is. It has to be a unity with God and then a unity with one another. I don't pray you should take them out of the world. You know, sometimes we say, well, man, wouldn't it be just good you get saved and you get zapped? 
and it's all over. Yeah, I'm gone. No, God wants to leave you here to be a light and a lamp to so many people who don't know where to turn, who are living in the dark. But you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, Jesus said. Sanctify them by your truth. Make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have done what? I sent them into the world. Now, he's not just talking about those disciples because we know that in the context of what he says here, I'm not just praying for them, I'm praying for every person who will believe. So God is sending you into the world. Somebody, by the grace of God, God sent somebody to you. However that happened, sometimes the circumstances can be so twisty in each, each of our lives, but God sent someone to you. And maybe at first you thought, nuts, crazy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Not a chance. But God opened your heart and opened your mind and showed you Christ. So what are you going to do? Are you going to say, oh, this is good. I got it. But are you going to say, I got it to give it away, to share with others the good news, to rescue others, to stop them before they go over the cliff? So they all may be one, he says in John 17, 21, as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loves you today. God loves people today. He loves the people that are your enemies, that don't like you. He still loves them. And he reaches out to them and he cares and he, he, he wants us to be the means. He uses people like you and me to the means to be able to share the gospel. In John 17, 22, he says, The glory which you gave me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me. Jesus is interested in your neighbor. He's interested in the people of your village. He's interested in the people that you know. He's interested in your family. Are you? How interested are we? Are we willing to, to share the good news with them even if they think you're crazy? Or do we keep it to ourselves? Do we say, oh, well, I've got it. If they don't, tough, tough luck. Or are we ready to give away this wonderful gospel? Why should we proclaim it? Why should we go out and, and share with people about Jesus Christ? Uh, here's why, because people are lost. The people are lost without Christ. You can have all the riches of this world, you can have everything that the world has to offer you, but if you don't have Christ, you're lost. You are lost and you will die in your sins. John 8, 21, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me. He's speaking to the Pharisees who are rejecting him. And he said, you will die in your sins and where I go, you cannot come. Right today, if a person dies in their sins, they cannot go where Jesus is. You cannot. There is no option when you get on the other side to say, I've changed my mind. Oh, just a minute, Take, send me back. It's not going to happen that way. It's just not. John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you, this is Jesus, that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now he gives the answer, and that is to trust in Jesus Christ, and then you will not die in your sins. So either you're going to die in your sins, or you're going to die without your sin. Which will it be? That might be true for us that are here. Maybe many of you have said, no, I've trusted Christ. I'm not going to die in my sins. But let me tell you this. Your neighbor, if they don't believe in Jesus, they will die in their sins. They will. And it's not like, oh, there's only a few people that have sinned. No. Every person, everyone has sinned. The problem is with sin is this. It's like crime. Supposing... I, uh, I um, send somebody and I say, hey, listen, bud, you go down to that store, you walk in there, you take a little turn, grab something and take off out, nobody will bother you. So, guy does it, comes back, hey, good, good advice. 
Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to do it again. I never got caught. Right? So they go and do it again. And now we're in, in some places in North America now, they're just busting the stores wide open. Why? Because they don't, they, they actually made a law that said, well, anything under $800 worth of goods, we won't charge you. <laughs> now, talk about ridiculous, right? Yeah. So we're going to do this because we're, we're getting jammed up with these criminals, so we'll just tell them, we won't charge you if you, if you, don't, if, 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 if you rob less than $800. So what happened? Everybody got robbed, right? Here's what it says. It's in the Bible, by the way. There's good advice in the Bible, for, even for politicians, if they would only listen. Sometimes, because the sentence for a crime isn't carried out quickly, people make plans to commit even more crimes. Is that true? That's true. Now, let's think about this in a spiritual way. Because judgment against an evil work doesn't happen right away. People's hearts are fully set to do evil. I got away with it. I can live this way. I can do what I want. I don't have to have Jesus. I'm getting along good now. I got what I need. I'm doing what I want. I'm cool. But all, all the while, their sin is piling up for the day of judgment. So, so what? That's a long ways away. Right now, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. So they make plans to keep on sinning. So I'm not talking here about going and breaking into a store. I'm just talking about sin. And everyone has sinned. Everyone. And everyone stands guilty. You too. You're guilty today. Without Christ, you're guilty. Now we know whatever the law says, Romans 3.19, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. You know what it means by every mouth may be stopped? No excuse. I was the king of excuses when I was a kid. It was always somebody else's fault or some, I could make up stories on the snap. And some of them sounded pretty good actually. But after a while, no teacher believed any story I ever told them about how things went down. It was much more elaborate than the dog ate my homework. <laughs> that every mouth may be stopped. In other words, you've got nothing to say. You have no defense. Why? Why? So that all the world may become guilty before God. Guilty. I mean, you know, when you're going to court, you're hoping for a not guilty plea. And sometimes, you know, people are as guilty as sin, but nevertheless, they're hoping a good lawyer will get them off. There is no lawyer in the world that can get you off before God, except one. And his name is Jesus. The reason why he can be the lawyer to get you off is that he died for your sins, that he suffered all the punishment you deserve for your sins, so that the price was paid by him and it doesn't have to be paid for by you. That's the only way you can get off. Somebody's got to suffer for your sins. You will or Jesus will. Now, not will, but he has. You accept his payment for your sins and you will not suffer for them. That's good news, wouldn't you say? Yes. <laughs> Now, it's not good news to somebody who doesn't even think about it or doesn't care. I don't care. Well, it doesn't matter to me that Jesus died on a cross. But it's the best news in the world when you know that it is appointed for men, that's women included, by the way, to die what? Once. Once. Forget about reincarnation. You're not coming back as a bug or coming back as a butterfly. For a man to die once, but after this, what happens? the judgment, the judgment. If you were to leave this world at this moment, at this very second, you would stand before Almighty God and you would have to give an account for your sins. And if you don't have Jesus there to pay for them, you will die and go to hell. I have to tell the truth because that's how serious it is. If it wasn't that serious, 
I wouldn't. Why would I spend my life preaching the gospel? I'm not preaching the gospel so that I can have fame and fortune. I never got no fame and fortune out of preaching the gospel, I can assure you. But I have seen God save and rescue and cause people to come into a whole new life with Jesus Christ. And that, my friend, is worth more than all the things of this world. Isn't that amazing? It is. This is an urgent message. This isn't something that we can say, well, yeah, some more convenient day I'll trust Christ. But it is urgent now. It is urgent for those who need to receive it, but it's also urgent for us to share it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. It is always now because you have no promise of tomorrow. You have no promise of 10 more minutes. Now is always the time to take Christ as your Savior. And Jesus saw that urgency when he said this in John chapter 4, verse 35. He had been sharing with a woman at a well. And this woman had heard the message that Jesus had for her. A woman who had five husbands and the one she was with was not her husband. A woman who had, uh, was shunned by the rest of the women of, the, of, of Samaria. A woman who had came to the well to get water when nobody else was there because she was isolated because of her sins. This woman, Jesus shared the truth with her and she believed him. She left her water pot. You don't do that. It's not when you're walking a great distance from the city to a well in a desert climate to get water. Let me tell you, you don't do that. I've been in Africa and I know what it's like for women to have to walk miles and miles to get water. You don't leave your water pot. But she left her water pot. Why did she leave her water pot? Because she got the living water from Jesus Christ. It was far sweeter and far deeper and far most precious. And she couldn't wait to get back to the city and told all the men. She had a relationship with the men, but not with the women. It tells you something about her lifestyle. She told all the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this not be the Christ? And so they all come. They all start coming. They listen to her. And so out of Sychar comes these P Samaritans. They're all coming. And while they're coming, Jesus said, don't say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. And it may very well be that as he said that, there would have been a, in the field, all these men coming in their white robes towards Jesus to hear the message. And they did come, and they did believe. And they said, now we know, now we believe, not because you told us, but we've heard him for ourselves, and we know this is the Christ who is to come into the world. But Jesus said, there's a harvest. There's a harvest. Now this time of the year is harvest time. This time of the year is when people are taking in their gardens and their fruits and their vegetables and whatever it is that they've grown. And if you don't harvest, when it's harvest time, what happens? Not much comes out of it. I am not a gardener. I have no green thumb. I don't have a green toe. I have no, well, it might be green by times, but not green in that way. I have no ability to grow stuff. I can catch fish. I can raise cattle, whatever, but gardening is not my, not my forte. And I can grow tomatoes, but then they end up rotting on the vine half the time because I'm never there. I don't weed. So I'm not the person for harvesting in the garden, but may by the grace of God let me be there to harvest people's souls. That is to, to, to harvest, to bring people into Christ, to get them to the place where, yes, I, they know they need Jesus. And Jesus was telling his disciples, look, 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 the fields are white for harvest. The grain is falling. Now's the time. And that's what happens to grain. As soon as it turns white, it needs to be harvested right away or else it falls to the ground and it perishes. So Jesus said, don't wait. There's not, don't wait four months. Don't think, yeah, somewhere down the road I will share with my neighbor about Jesus. Because you know what will happen? Someday your neighbor will be dead 
And you'll say, I wish, I wish I had said something about Jesus to them. Because that leaves you with a huge question mark. Where will they spend eternity? So Jesus speaks about sowing and reaping. He says, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. And the wages and the fruit that he's talking about is not money. It is not grain in the barn. He's talking about the precious souls of people that they might know Christ, that they might be saved, that they might be in, in, in eternity in heaven with them. So the one that sows and the one that reaps may rejoice together. And what he speaks of here is in the process of, of harvesting, you're going to sow and you're going to reap. And so sow away. In other words, share the truth with people. Share Bible verses. Talk to them about their need. Warn them of the wrath to come, the judgment of God. Encourage them that there's a Savior who loves them and who died for them. It doesn't mean that you're going to be there when the harvest happens. Maybe you'll share and then somebody else will come along and bang. They'll be saved. Maybe somebody else is praying for this person and suddenly God uses someone else. It's like myself. I know my brother and his friends were praying for me and things started to happen and then the very morning I decided there was no God and that it was, God wasn't looking for me and I didn't believe in him and he was a, it was foolishness and all my imagination because God was chasing me and he was but I was trying to get away. What does God do but send a truck driver who drops off lumber next door to where I was working and the guy sees me and comes in and starts to ask me a question what time it was and I told him and he said hey, well here's a got a pen and a piece of paper he wrote it on something and he handed it to me he said anytime you want to talk about Jesus here's my address and phone number I mean he didn't preach a big sermon to me he didn't say a lot but he spoke about Jesus and that was the straw that broke the camel's back and I was saved within two days of that God knows what he's doing and he uses you to sow a seed. He uses you to say a little word here, a word there. But he doesn't use you to do nothing. He just doesn't. For the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap at which you have not labored. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. Yeah, it's all, a, God is the, the orchestrator of it all. But he's looking for, the, for us to be ready to be doing his will, to do whatever he wants to share with others. See, Jesus commands us to go. It's not like it's an option. He commands it. Jesus came and spoke to the disciples and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, that's encouraging. In other words, there's nobody higher than me, Jesus says. That's nice to know. Go, therefore, because all authority is given to me, then you go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. That is people who follow Jesus. Not just people who say they follow Jesus, but people who actually do that. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So here's the man with all the authority, Jesus. And here he says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And in that sandwich, we're the ones that are to go. But that's under his power, under his authority, and his presence. I'm with you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples were, you know, they were decimated when Christ died. Then he rose from the dead. They were excited. And then he says, I'm leaving you. I'm going back to heaven. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. They had a question for him. Their question was, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, we want to know what's going to unfold next. Are you going to make Israel glorious, mighty kingdom? Are you going to do it this way? Are you going to do it that way? And how many Christians are preoccupied with how God is going to do this or that or the other or what the end of the world is going to be like and what's going to do there? And God, what are you going to do next? And here's what Jesus says. His answer to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Never mind that, he says. Don't get so tied up in that stuff. 
Man, Christians are having lengthy Bible studies trying to figure out who the Antichrist might be and just when exactly the end of the world is going to happen. He said, that's not your business. The Father has that in His own authority. But what does He say? But here's what I want you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the end of the earth. Well, this is part of the end of the earth right here in Shetty Camp. Some people think it is the end of the earth. But they didn't get to meet Cove yet. <laughs> you will be my witnesses. This is what matters, he says. Never mind trying to figure all that out. That's the Father's business. Your business is to receive the Spirit of God, believe in His power, and trust in Him, and be witnesses for me. Declare the gospel throughout the entire world. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. His own special people. He's not talking about some man in robes and funny hats. He's talking about you and me. Whatever you do, whatever you are, you're a hairdresser or a nail fixer or whatever they call them, or an eyebrow clipper, whatever you are, or you're a fisherman or a, or a, a preacher or a teacher, or whatever you are, you're royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're called out by God. You're his own special people. For what purpose? So that you would proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. That's, Hallelujah. Just, that's what God calls you to do. Amen. You were once not a people. You didn't belong to Jesus. But now you do. You're now one of the people of God. You had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. But for what? To share with others. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Set apart, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Put God first. And that's vital. That's why Jesus was talking about you've got to be one with him. I mean, I, I, no one wants to, you don't need a club behind you to say, get out there and share the gospel with people, you <laughs> rotten. It's not the way. It is if I, if I had the love of God in me, Paul said, the love of Christ compels me to go. God's love, if I'm going to be in union with Jesus, if I'm going to walk in the Spirit with Christ, then I'm going to love like Christ. Then I'm going to look at people and I'm going to love them. And I'm going to desire for them to know Him and to be saved and to have the peace and the power and the wonder of God in their lives. Put, a, put the Lord first in your heart and always be ready, always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or respect. And this verse here talks about that very reality. It says, people are asking you, what makes you tick? Why would people be asking you, listen to this. If you walk in the Spirit and if Christ is your life, and if the peace of God that passes understanding is guarding your heart and your mind, if you're full of the Spirit of God, somebody's going to ask you, what's going on? Why are you like this? How can you have peace in a storm? How can you love your enemies? How can you be so forgiving? They're going to ask you, and it says, be ready, be ready, be ready to give an answer. Sharing the gospel is the wisest thing to do with your time. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. In other words, those who walk in the Spirit, they're producing a glorious tree of life. Instead of death, they spread life. This world is spreading a lot of death now. I mean, our culture is a culture of death. It's a culture of misery. But the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And what does it say out of that? And he who wins souls is wise. It's the wisest thing you can do with your time. Is share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Romans 10, 13 says, Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that good news? Right? Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord, if you call on the Lord Jesus Christ from your heart, if you call on him, you will be saved. That's great news. Huh. But listen what it says here. Well, how will they call on him if they haven't believed in him? And how can they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, 
I want you to understand this. When it says, how shall they hear without a preacher, it doesn't mean just me. I'm a preacher, yes. But what it means, how will they hear without somebody that proclaims it? And I want you to know you're called to proclaim it, not just me. Don't depend on me. I can't reach the people that you know. I, I, I don't know them all. I can reach some, but you can reach the people that are around you. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? In other words, God wants to send you out. Are you willing to say to him, Lord, here am I. Do whatever you want with me. Lord, free my lips to share with people. As it is written, how beautiful the feet are of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I like that passage because my feet are not beautiful. But they're beautiful if they're going in the direction of serving others, of loving others, of giving them the good news. And so he, he uses the word feet here to show you something. It means you don't just stand and do nothing, but you go forward and share with people. Now, these ladies here, you, you guys actually uh, do stuff to people's feet, like their toes and everything like that. Well, that's a very interesting profession. And I'm sure sometimes you get people who you know, put their feet up and, oh, they're lovely. But then again, I'm sure there's probably been some stories already told about, you're never going to get my feet, I can tell you that. Let me put that way. <laughs> but let me tell you something. If they were gnarled and twisted, if they were gross to the grossest of gross, but if those stubby little feet are going forward and you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're beautiful feet. Amen. They're really beautiful feet. The Apostle Paul said this, I would gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Even though I love you more and the less you love me, I don't care. I will spend and be spent. That love of God that would cause you to go and share with people. Share this news. And here's what he says. This is what God told Paul, and here's the plan of it, because you have to share the truth. God, Paul, God's, Jesus said to Paul in Acts 26, 18, I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they could receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are made holy by faith in me, sanctified by faith in me. He says, I'm sending you with a message, and it's a message that actually transforms your life. It transforms the lives of people. It, their eyes become open. They see things as they really are. They turn from the power of Satan to the power of God. They receive the forgiveness of sins. Amen. You don't die in your sins. They receive an inheritance. Heaven itself is yours. And the very person and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, and they become holy. Their life changes. God changes your life when you get saved. You see, the message of the cross, the message of that Christ died for your sins and you can be saved is foolishness to those who are perishing. Was it foolish to you at one time? It was. It didn't make no sense at all. So what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. Now here's the thing. Most of us feel inadequate with sharing with people. Better leave that up to somebody who is a little more eloquent than me. Now, God has given me the gift of gab, if you haven't noticed. I know that. But I can tell you that before I preach every Sunday, I pray and I feel weak. I feel inadequate to stand in front of you and share the gospel. And I want to feel that way. I don't want to feel like I've got it all together. I feel a weakness in myself. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, this is the message. It's about Christ. It's about His death on the cross for you. It's His salvation. And he says this, I was with you, this is Paul, in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. 
I have felt all these things and I feel them every week. And I feel them often when it comes to sharing the gospel with people. I don't feel adequate. <coughs> and when you begin to feel adequate, you're probably not. So don't let that stop you. It didn't stop the Apostle Paul. Don't let that be, well, I don't know what I could say. I don't know very much. Let me, let me tell you something. If you know Christ and you know that you're saved, you know a lot. Tell what you know. Never mind telling, trying to tell what you don't know. No point in that. But you can tell what you know. It may not seem like much, but it's a lot to someone who has never heard. He said, my preaching was not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And that is always my prayer when I preach or proclaim or try to live is, Lord, I have to do this in the power of the Spirit. Your Holy Spirit has to come and do this or it's, not gonna, it's just going to fall to the ground. And I know probably three quarters of my preaching falls to the ground, but I pray at least a quarter will burn in someone's heart and transform their lives and save sinners and draw us to Christ. Because he says, I want your faith not to be in the wisdom of men, but I want it to be in the power of God. God's power, God's presence, God's ability. We need to proclaim the true gospel. We need to proclaim it with our lives. If it's not with your life, then your lips are useless. And what's the point of being a hypocrite, right? What's the point of saying one thing and doing another? With our lives and with our lips and by the power of God. And praise God, it can be so. So a man named Isaiah in the Old Testament was in a place where he was decimated when he saw the, the glory of God. He was just broken. He said, I'm, I'm undone. I'm undone. And then the Lord said to him, whom will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said this, Here am I, send me. So by the grace of God, maybe you need to say today, Lord, uh, not much, there's not much here, but you have me. Here am I, send me. Go this week, maybe with the thought, as you go to the co-op or wherever you go, to start praying for individuals, for their souls. We are pretty good at praying for people who are sick, right? Oh, we've got to pray for that person, they're sick. Oh, this per that person's sick, we need to pray for them. And we kind of remember that, don't we? we it hits us. We, we see it, the physical need is there. But do we pray for their souls? Do we pray for the salvation of lost people? Or have we missed the boat on this? And are we ready to proclaim, as much as we know, in a weakness that we are, the little bit of truth that we do know? Take a, a risk, shall we say, in that direction. To be a little more bold, a little more ready to share with people, because people need to hear the message, even if they don't like it at the time. But you'll be surprised. The devil is always telling me this. He's always speaking to me and saying, they don't want to hear that. Don't say anything. You do, you know what's going to happen. Don't listen to that voice. Just listen to the words of Jesus. You go, I've got authority, and I'll be with you. And trust him for the results. Never know. I can often think about that man who came and spoke to me, and I cursed at him, and I told him to get lost, and I never saw him again, and I never heard from him again. I don't even know his name because he gave me his name and address and I ripped it up and I threw it in the, in the, in the trash can, his name and his phone number, when I was so angry at him when he came and talked to me about Jesus. But I was saved two days later. I can just well imagine when he left, boy, I blew it there. Uh, that, would, that didn't go anywhere. That guy there, is, <laughs> he just cursed me upside down. I'm going to see him in heaven and he's going to see the fruit of his labor. He's going to say, what? You're here? How did that happen? I said, you shared with me. That's what I'll tell him. You shared with me. 
I'm here because you shared with me. Now, that's priceless, isn't it? That's priceless. And God will use you in some... I mean, the guy didn't preach to me. He never even... He just mentioned the name of Jesus. He didn't talk about Jesus. Here's my name and my address and my phone number. That's all. He didn't preach a long sermon to me. But it was just what I needed to hear at just that moment. And the power of the Holy Spirit worked. I got saved. You never know how many will be in heaven as a result of your looking at the harvest field and saying, okay, Lord, here am I, send me. May God use each one of us for his glory in this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, send us out in our weakness. Draw us to yourself. Cause us, Lord, to be used by you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.